our next speaker is uh, Rodrigo Nogueira from uh, Unicomp, Associate Professor at Unicomp, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and also a uh, consultant and advisor at Zeta Alpha. And he'll be talking about uh, adapting large language models to new languages and domain. Rodrigo, it's with you. Well, hi, everyone. So it's great that News and Susan gave already the foundations for my talk. Uh, hopefully, I'll try to convince you there is an alternative for many problems that News and Susan gave, and uh, especially in terms of continual pre-training and adapting, adapting these large language models to the domains that we actually care about. So uh, um, this is the agenda of my talk, five parts. The first one, I'll talk about general purpose uh, LLMs like ChatGPT and BARD. Uh, then later, two augmented uh, large language models. And by two, I mean search engines. You could have access to Excel spreadsheets, things like that. And then part three, how we specialize these models into domains and tasks that we care about. And then finally, one cool thing that I think uh, we can use these models for is uh, hypothesis generators and how are they connected with specialized la large language models. So first part, uh, general purpose LLMs. Uh, if you played with ChatGPT, especially the uh, GPT-4, you notice it has an impressive memory. Uh, so I asked uh, what movies were made by Paul Verhoeven? Uh, I hope my pronunciation is OK. In Dutch? No, it's terrible. <laughs> so it's a the famous Dutch uh, movie director. He made movies such as Robocop. And then I asked uh, GPT-3.5, uh, he gave me uh, all the movies correctly, precision 100%, but he missed 50, uh, half of these movies made by, by Paul. Don't try to say the last name. Uh, and then I asked GPT-4 uh, the same question and gave uh, all the movies he made. So it's kind of impressive that we're already talking about these large language models, even though they weren't designed to be these memorizers, these database, they are still have this capacity. And now the question is how they acquire all this knowledge. And here are the main ingredients to create an LLM. Um, I am, I'm taking here the example of Lyoma 2 published by uh, Meta. It has 70 billion parameters. So the first thing we do, we go collect a bunch of data from the web, Wikipedia, books, news, uh, code. And this is roughly about 2 trillion tokens, which is equivalent to a human reading nonstop for 8,000 years. So it's a ton of material to read. And then we get access to a large cluster, uh, meaning 2,000 GPUs for one month. This costs uh, millions of uh, US dollars. And the electricity to train these models is equivalent to what the uh, 90 Dutchess consume during the year. So it's quite a lot, of, a lot of electricity. And then we take the transformer model, 70 billion parameters. So in other words, there are lots of things that we can tweak in this, this model so it can learn to execute the task. And in this case, the task is simply to predict the next word given the previous words in out of these samples of these two, uh, two trillion tokens extracted from the web. So this is the pool pipeline that we usually, 95% of the budget when creating models like ChatGPT are spent here uh, in trying to predict the next word. We collect a bunch of data and let the model train our cluster. And then the question is, how far we can go with these models? And we evaluated them uh, on entrance exam. It's a nationwide Brazilian nat um, nationwide entrance exam. It's called NN. In 2022, in questions that involved reasoning, uh, math, uh, chemistry, physics. And these are likely not seen during training because the exam was applied before these models were trained. And what we see here in this chart is that uh, GPT-3, uh, GPT-3 uh, released 2020, got close to random, and then GPT-3.5, uh, it's much better. Uh, it was released uh, last year, and then GPT-4 gets even better. I believe the, the average performance is around 50% of uh, students taking this exam, so GPT-4 is already doing much better than the average uh, student that takes these exams. And here, the point of this chart is to make that we, we are seeing progress uh, with these LLMs, and uh, the progress we not often see is simply due to more compute and collecting more data. So it doesn't require uh, breakthroughs in terms of uh, uh, new ideas for how to train these models. So it's more like a, I, I can get a, a larger cluster and then I get in the end a better model. And one nice thing about the way they generate the answers is using this technique cha uh, called chain of thought. 
in which you induce the model to first generate a step-by-step -step, uh, explanation uh, before attempting to give you the final answer. So it's kind of um, impressive what they can do. And I guess the the the, the like the sentiment that uh, I I often feel when talking to people is that there is this attractor called LLM that is engulfing everything. Like I don't use Google Translate anymore. I don't use Stack Overflow. I don't use Grammarly. I always go to ChatGPT and ask these questions. Um, if you are working with uh, natural language processing, you don't often hear more talking about CNNs or RNNs or feature extractor plus SVMs. Uh, reference resolution, uh, not sure if we need them anymore. So there's this very like sentiment that uh, everything will become one single gigantic model that knows everything. And then the question is, what is there for us? Uh, what can we work on? And uh, uh, one thing that uh, many people are starting to work on uh, these days is these two augmented large language models. So Niels uh, gave nice examples of how we can integrate these models, Susan as well, with retrieval systems. So suppose you have, um, you want to create this medical AI assistant. Um, and this large language model is coupled with a search engine. And the patient arrived at the doctor and says, hi, doctor, my ear hurts. And then the LLM says, hi, I will search the latest literature for uh, about causes for ear pain. And then goes to this awesome search engine that solves all the problems, retrieve thousand relevant documents, like no mistake, and then makes this summary of thousand uh, latest literature about ear pain. And then asks the patient, According to the literature, there are eight major possible causes for, for ear pain. Could you please tell me if you have one of the following symptoms? Suppose that this works, uh, feels great, but it, it would you trust if you arrive at a doctor that says, hold on a second, I'll search Google, Google Scholar to, to make my predictions. It feels there is something missing in this pipeline. And um, just, yeah. So this is the current paradigm that we have. We spend a, a ton of time, uh, months of training, trillions of tokens, dozens of millions of dollars uh, doing this general purpose training. And then at inference time, we give the model a few thousand tokens, like one or two page instruction set, access to two. And then we hope that this model will become the expert in our task in just 10 seconds, because that's the patience that the user has. And so something in between here it feels that is missing. Like we have this general purpose model, a lot of money, and then we have this a few seconds to become an expert. And now gives the uh, the segue to, to the next part of my talk. So like what is the best way to use all these parameters that the model is memorizing? So it spent a ton of time in, uh, trying to memorize what movies were made by this famous Dutch director. Uh, even the it got it right the year, but uh, is that a good use for all these uh, these parameters? And that's why we arrived at the specialized large language models. Uh, one thing we can do it's um, take this general purpose training. The model is already good, and then we do more fine tuning, not fine tuning on supervised data, but self supervised data. So we go there, collect high quality training data sets like text from the domains that we actually care. So if you're doing um, using these models for coding, you collect code data. If you're using them for some language-specific tasks, uh, you go there and collect text from on that language. But now the the thing is that um, you're using way less uh, tokens in the orders of instead of trillions in the orders of uh, uh, ten billion tokens, and also uh, you're using way less compute power. So even us could have access to such a cluster, so we can fine-tune models. Uh, at this, uh, using this scale of data, and the question is actually, does is that help? Does that help? So uh, here I show results from three independent works. Uh, the first one is from Google. It's called the Minerva uh, model. What they did, they took Palm with 500 billion parameters, and uh, with three uh, three percent more compute and a lot of 26 billion tokens, they were able to get this uh, jump in performance in math-related tasks. So it's quite a nice improvement in, uh, with respect to the original baseline model. Uh, Llama, code Llama was released a few year, weeks ago. Uh, they took Llama 2, the 34 billion model. I spent 25% more compute and collected 500 billion tokens. And then they arrived at code Llama, which is much better than the origin, original Llama 2 model at coding. 
uh, even though Lyoma 2 was already trained on, on a bunch of code. So it seems that uh, doing this further pre-training helps. And this is the work made uh, by my group. Uh, we took Lyoma 1, 65 billion parameters using computation that Google graciously uh, gave us. 0.% uh, more compute than what was originally used by uh, Lyoma. Uh, 10 billion tokens in Portuguese. And then we created this model called Sabia, which is quite good in Portuguese. It's even beats uh, ChatGPT three and a half on 14 Portuguese data sets. So a bit of a specialization helps a lot uh, in this case. But one thing I think the part that I'm most excited about is not only making these models better, I think this will naturally occur, but this is a more in the future, what we can use them uh, for things that we cannot even imagine these days. And this is the, uh, this news just came out yesterday. Uh, I believe it's correct, it's from Business Insider, so yeah. But the thing is, uh, there is this mother that was for about three years looking for, she consulted 17 doctors. Um, her kid has this rare disease that none of the doctors could find. Uh, and then she, after uh, all these experience, she described the symptoms to ChatGPT. And then ChatGPT suggested that could be a rare symptom. And then she consulted a doctor and then that confirmed that was the symptom in case. So the point of this slide, and even though this is a detecto evidence, uh, the point of this slide is to show they could be used to generate hypotheses that none of us could uh, surface. And I think this is a nice application. And I even did the experiment myself. So what I did, I so OpenAI uh, allowed us to fine tune uh, GPT-3 and a half. And I, I came up with three different set, set of documents. The first set, uh, which is literature A, it's an uh, invented plant called Tropicana azurea. It has this compound called azurea lean. That's fine. Then there is literature B, another document. Uh, it says azurea lean inhibits uh, the production of neuroplin 5, which is a protein also invented. And then there is a literature C that says patient with this uh, cerebrosync dysfunction syndrome, also invented, they have high levels of this protein. So these are all three invented sets of documents. I fine tuned ChatGPT and I have uh, with this literature. And then I asked, propose a plant that could be used to treat the cerebrosync dysfunction syndrome, uh, explain the reason. And then uh, the model answered, for the treatment of CDS, the plant Tropicana azurea could, pro uh, could prove to be a promising candidate. This plant is known to produce a rare compound cal called azurealine. Azurealine has found to inhibit the synthesis of neuroplin 5. Uh, neuroplin 5 is a protein whose overproduction has been found in CDS patient. So it's quite amazing that it could connect these disjoint sets of literature internally in its weights. Nobody knows how it does, but um, it was able to produce this answer. And this is where I hope we'll see more and more of these applications in the future, like co connecting these parts in the literature that no human could make. Uh, you could argue that it could also do this with a uh, retrieval, uh, retrieval, a search engine. But uh, I argue that it's very really hard to make all these hops. Like you first have to find the the, the disease, the the pay attention in the document that is high level, this protein might be related to this compound and so on. So the model is already doing this internally. And I think in the future, we'll see more and more of these suggestions, these hypothesis generators based on these in domain specifics, fine tunings. And yeah, that concludes my talk. Uh, I think at present we have this impression that uh, LLM soaks, uh, engulfing everything, uh, just one general purpose model. But I think in the future, we'll have more a society of diverse and specialized models, each one talking to each other. We can might help them also arrive at a correct conclusion. But uh, yeah, we'll see more and more of these, not, not a single one, GPT-6 or 7. Yeah. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Rodrigo. So now we're open for questions. Uh, please do raise your, hand, raise your hands and then as you choose. I'll start from the back because uh, they were a bit underappreciated before. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, thank you for your talk, uh, Rodrigo, very nice. Um, I'm, I have one little 
question about your last hypothesis generation thing. If I recall correctly, you said you were fine tuning the model and then generated the hypothesis. Have you done an experimentation with doing this just by prompting, feeding uh -huh. this information into the prompts and make it hypothesize? Yeah. If you give the correct information, like uh, if you just give this three separate pieces of evidence, it sure you'll arrive at a correct uh, hypothesis. But the question lies in then the search engine bottleneck, how we can find among all these millions of uh, different plants and disease and proteins, the correct ones. And we actually have, there are many studies, uh, including from, from my own group that says search engine is the bottleneck. Like if it misses one of, puts irrelevant documents on top and then everybody knows they hallucinate. And the point is, um, yeah, it's, it's very hard to, to put in the prompt these three types of documents, whereas with uh, fine tune, we don't care. We just train on everything and hopefully the model will generate a hypothesis. I know it's brittle, but uh, yeah, it might, it might work. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so my kind of intuition would be that when you uh, fine tune uh, a model further and you know, specify it on a on a certain domain, it kind of has, has like it has to like forget some some aspects of the original training or, or like just kind of like um, does this happen and like yeah what you know what yeah. gets lost in the, what what gets lost in there and yeah yeah I should have used my my charts of backup slides so there is a curve saying that uh, as they uh, we know this for Sabia uh, as it learns more Portuguese it starts to forget English so it gets worse in English task so I think that is always a trade off in terms of compute and uh, model size and the performance in domain. Uh, maybe maybe if you have a model with two trillion parameters, it won't forget anything. But then the question is uh, how much to train this model. And yeah, but they forget. They, for they forget slowly, but they forget. Yeah. Just a question about your, your final sort of conclusion about maybe there being a diversity of specialized models it seems to run counter to the argument you're making on the final slide, which is that to draw connections between diverse sources, it's helpful to have them all combined within one model. Yeah. So sort of which which argument do you sort of yeah. see this pointing towards? Yeah, th that's a great question. I, I think in order to uh, having good hypothesis generators, we have to have specialists. Like it's very hard to memorize all the subtleties in each one of the domains. Uh, so. That's why I think models hallucinate. Like we're just asking GPT-4 to memorize the entire web. Whereas... Isn't, isn't this pointing towards a bigger model, right? Rather than more small models. Uh, I, think you, I think you need smaller models specializing in each one of the domains. For in this case, there will be a model specializing in treating these types of syndromes and they, they will be trained on all the literature related to and including the peripheral ones, but hopefully not trained on to memorize Taylor Swift songs. Things like that. Yeah. Fair I thank you for the, for the talk. Uh, I was just interested by your comment about forgetting. Uh, as soon as the model starts to forget something, you're actually wasting compute, right? Because you're using all this compute to train it and then adding more data and it may, you waste the resources you used to acquire, make it acquire these abilities in the first place. Right. But, but then if you, if you only care about the performance on certain domain, it doesn't matter. It starts to forget the previous other stuff in the past. So it starts to... Uh, get better and better in Portuguese and starts to forget about English. But uh, if it's during its lifetime, we'll only see Portuguese texts. Uh, it actually, we don't care if it learns its ability to understand English. Right, that makes sense. For the performance, it, it doesn't matter. But for the efficiency of, of training these specialized models, uh, this would this is very, very bad, right? Uh, I'm not sure if all, it's, it's always getting better in, in the domain that we care about uh, in the end. Uh, yeah, but well, maybe you can take offline. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or, or, or I'll talk to you in the in the computer. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, you had on one of your slides a uh, nice uh, phrase like, "Can we make better use of all of these parameters?" Um, you're thinking about fine tuning expert models on expert data. Can we also go the other direction, just from the pre-training phase onwards, from the start, 
train a model that directly does retrieval augmentation and just learns how to use language, but actually gets all of his knowledge from the external data? Yeah, I think that's, that's a good direction. And that there are many, like the, the textbooks, all you need papers, series of papers, and uh, there are people that have been trying to use retrieval augmented to enhance the, the pre-training corpora. Um, the question is, uh, how much you can be specialized at first. Uh, maybe you need to be broad uh, in your initial pre-training and then later specialized, but it might just work being specialized at the beginning. But but I think it's a, it's a good point. That it's, it's more of data curation uh, than anything else. Further, Sam? This one. Thank you, Rodrigo, for the great talk. Uh, I have a question on the fine tuning mm -hmm. because there's a, a next talk on prediction and there's also a reinforcement learning from human feedback. Yeah. Which part is being affected when you do fine tuning? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know. Uh, it seems that the model still keeps its uh, conversational capabilities, even though it was uh, pre trained on, I believe in this case, was 10,000 documents. So it still remembers how to make good conversations. Probably it deteriorates a bit, but there is this extra complication that you need to also, if you want to have a really chatbot, you need to do another step of fine tuning, uh, reinforcement learning fine tuning, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.